Welcome to this episode of SDR News Live. I'm Andy McCaskey from SDR News. And in this series, we look at uh, topics of interest to IT professionals around the world. And if you're talking about around the world, one of the first thing that comes to mind is how do you communicate with people in different areas? And that leads us to today's topic, which is a discussion of video conferencing. Our uh, guide here today is the evangelist from Life Size, Mr. Simon Dudley. Hi, Andy. Good to see you. All right, well, it's uh, great to have you here with us uh, again. We're going to be talking about uh, hardware and the transition to the cloud. And I think that there's, there are really two types of hardware that uh, we need to be talking about in thinking about the transition for professional-grade video conferencing, aren't there? Yes, there is, Andy. There's, if you think of it in two ways, traditionally video conferencing has been a specific hardware technology at both the endpoint level and the, the infrastructure level. What's happened in the last year or so is the infrastructure has gone from being dedicated, unusual, specialized hardware to now being virtualized in many cases, x86 type boxes, a complete consequence of Moore's law and an entirely logical step. However, just like the PC industry is now moving away and people are moving to dedicated technology for the technology they interact with, video conferencing is remaining a dedicated piece of technology in the meeting room. It isn't going to a PC-based environment in the same way that a, a Roku box or an Apple TV, for example, are the sort of thing that people use in their home theatre technologies rather than installing a PC. So, yes, there's two ways, there's two parts to it, and it's interesting that x86 boxes are definitely taking over in infrastructure, but they're not taking over in the room systems. Yes. Well, it's interesting also to uh, think about a um, the jump that we see in cloud-based, purely cloud-based systems uh, that are, are web conferencing types of systems. Um, we, we neglect to, to recognize that professional systems are kind of going through the same process that's occurring in other parts of the data center, namely virtualization. Oh yes, absolutely. Virtualization is very important. Uh, we've been leading the charge for a while now, but the definitely a real thrust in video conferencing today is move away from those boxes to move to virtualized environments. Many clients actually install them as a pizza box device, uh, even with a label from the manufacturer on it and shove it in a data center. But at least it's a technology they understand. But others are also either putting it on virtualized uh, environments th of their own or giving it to someone like Rackspace or Amazon or others to run on their behalf. And we think that's a very interesting development because it allows customers to scale, not just to very large environments, but also to the small ones. Because it's interesting that the barrier to entry for video conferencing has always been so high that many customers have looked at it and gone, I'm sure it's great, but I don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get in the game. Because of virtualization, you can now start in tiny numbers, and then you know, for, for a few thousands or maybe $10,000, you can get into the game, check that the technology works within your organization, and then scale up from there. And we're finding that has, has some real power to it. So the, the notion then is trying to very uh, selectively figure out what works in your particular uh, environment. So sounds like there's still uh, an in, there's, there's a uh, place for endpoint hardware uh, for sure then, huh? Oh, oh yes, absolutely. It's, it's interesting to me that the customers who are most successful with video conferencing in our experience are the ones who start with room-based type technologies because you need the quality of the experience to be as good as physically being there or so close that people forget the technology exists. And then once they've understood that and built that into their workflow, into the way they do business, then they can expand it to desktops, to laptops, to mobile devices, to phones and uh, you know uh, tablets and that sort of stuff. But in our experience, the most successful environments are ones who start with super high quality in room systems and then go to ubiquity to allow many more people to participate through things like tablets and phones and, and, and other technologies. And it's interesting, it doesn't necessarily work the other way around. And I think it doesn't work the other way around because most customers don't see desktop video conferencing as a replacement for a meeting, but they do see it for a room-based solution. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and then of course the the role that mobile might uh, might then play uh, in allowing access to meetings that uh, were in fact originated uh, elsewhere on room-based uh, endpoint uh, equipment. Then, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the whole point. Um, the mobile solutions are superb for that person who can't make the big meeting, whether that meeting's physically there or, or over over a video conference. So we believe, and certainly the evidence would suggest we're right here, that the majority of meetings still happen meeting room to meeting room with quality of experience that's so good that people forget that they are using the technology. And then for the outliers, for the folks who can't physically get to the office or traveling that day, then a mobile or laptop type solution is an excellent replacement. It's an augmentation rather than a replacement for meeting rooms though, and and we're finding that an interesting angle. Yeah, well, it certainly is an interesting angle, and I can see it would be especially interesting if you could have um, hardware-based endpoints that were integrated with cloud-based uh, facilities, uh, as well as virtualization that may be on-prem, uh, bringing this all together for a, a really uh, interested, interesting and, and rich uh, video conference experience. Yes, one of the problems that tra- video conferencing has traditionally had And to be fair, it wasn't necessarily an aspect of it being virtualized, but the way it worked was that the endpoints and the infrastructure technology were very separate. In the same way that a um, an audio bridge type thing, if you ring an AT&T audio bridge or a ReadyTalk or one of those, you have to dial up and then you have to start pressing different numbers and get into a meeting room and hash, bang, star, thingamajig, and if you want to record the call, it's all this dial string stuff. And when you think about it, video conferencing was much the same until recently. What we did in the last year or so is to blur that line where the infrastructure ends and the endpoint starts at a point where the user doesn't know that. One of the problems has always been with video conferencing, and we kind of laugh about it, but it's a terrible story, that most customers need to have a degree in it to buy it, and you need to have a degree in video conferencing to sell it, because it's so complicated, and it's so complicated to use. You don't understand where one thing ends and another thing starts and how to get services. All that's gone away now. And this whole concept where you just simply pick up a remote control like this one, for example, it's got six buttons on it, and we've got all the power of the network without actually having to know anything about how it works. And we understand that most customers don't want a degree in this stuff. They just want to talk to Bob or whoever else they want to talk to. On the other hand, viewers of this program are interested in how that works. And I guess that's going to be the subject of our uh, next discussion when we bring in some of the experts uh, from LifeSize and uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, drill down into uh, the mechanics of how endpoints interrelate with virtualization that interrelate with uh, cloud-based activities. How how can people uh, find out more information about what LifeSize is doing in this area and uh, perhaps get in touch with you? You can find me on Twitter at Simon Dudley. And uh, LifeSize has a ton of material we've created in the last six months or so, which I think is really good, mainly because I wrote most of it. And it's (laughs) about use case scenarios of video conferencing. It's about how to use it. It's about how to equip your organization with the idea of how to use it. It it doesn't, we've got a bazillion documents about implementation and how it all physically works and it's great and you can read all that if you want to. But also we've got a lot of documentation we've created recently which is about the use cases, how to change your business to take uh, most uh, advantage of this technology, how it will affect the way that you do business and, and how you'd look, look to implement it. And we think some of these are really interesting. There are a series of ebooks which are all available on our website, which is, of course, lifesite.com. Talk about an evangelist. Uh, you are in the right job. <laughs> That's for sure. Look forward to having a chance to talk with you and uh, see you again, part two of the series. Uh, thanks to you folks for joining us here. I'm Andy McCaskey from SDR News.